Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to my panelists as well. Um, very happy and very excited to have this panel discussion on evolving communities. To start off, I'm just going to request all the panel members to introduce themselves. Morning, everyone. I'm Rohit. I'm one of the co-founding members and CEO at MyGate. MyGate, as a concept, you know, started in 2016. We saw that while the security is one of the main reason why people buy houses in communities, but somehow with a lot of external factors in the last decade, like rising e-commerce, having more and more people coming to communities and, you know, delivery boys entering the society. For example, a community who would like of a flat size of, say, 500, who would, you know, have visitors of, say, one or two people for every flat coming in a month, like relatives or friends. Suddenly it is bombarded with at least one or two people coming every day. That means thousands of people are entering in gated communities every day and it becomes very difficult to manage the in and out of people and who is coming, who is who is not authenticated and for security guards and even for residents, managing this problem from a intercom was not easy. Hence we came with a simple app with a lot of effort that, you know, uh, this can manage the gated communities, security and community issue and yeah, that's how we started this concept. Today we are you know, proud to have more than 25,000 communities in India who is using MyGate, almost 4 million families use. And we have also done a lot of work in community management. That means MyGate only doesn't help today only to do security, but it helps you to do a lot of stuff in the community like managing your amenity, to booking your pay maintenance payments, and, and, and so on and so forth. So yeah, that's about MyGate and myself. And thank you, Pavitra and, uh, and Bonappa for having me ever. I think I'm happy to contribute. Hi, I'm uh, Raghav. I run a company called Silla. So we actually provide facility and property management. We work uh, with Brigade in both the commercial and residential sides. And um, we actually have about 30% of our portfolio is residential property management which is a mix of developers as well as actually RWAs who are the eventual stakeholders. Uh, and I think this is an exciting uh, panel and a discussion because, you know, the, this whole community piece, I compared it, I was telling someone the other day that it's pretty similar to the e-commerce uh, bubble that was there earlier where it evolved from being, you know, views on your website to clicks to actually revenue and then today they're talking profit, right? Yeah. So in our experience of working with RWAs, there's been a pretty clear similarity to the way they've looked at communities, where earlier with property management, most of the MCs would focus just on five, six years ago, what is the lowest cost? And, you know, we're going to go with that person to manage our property. And then slowly, if you look at the common area maintenance costs and the breakup, they started factoring for revenue that they could earn mm. from marketing. So getting a Skoda to come display a car and we can earn this much and that can be set aside for, you know, uh, repairs and maintenance. So the eventual cam cost comes down and that's then evolved to having a, you know, revenue stream from events and community events to today them actually setting aside a budget and adding to the cam cost for community events. So if you really look at it, it makes sense, right? Ponapa, if you and I both buy a house at a brigade property like a brigade Eldorado, uh, as an example, we probably work in and around something around yeah. the airport. We probably have similar lifestyles because the budgets also match. We yeah. probably have a similar family life because we probably have kids that wanted those amenities. So we have all the right ingredients to be friends if you think about it. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's where... I'm glad we are friends you. though. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so yeah. Thanks for having us again. Absolutely. Thanks and welcome. Hi, I'm Anjali. I lead the sustainability at Zomato. And um, this is sustainability for the Zomato group, which includes Blinkit and Hyperpure and uh, Z Live, which is our live events platform. As we develop and we urbanize and we, we move into gated communities and even larger communities than what we may have originally lived in is that we'd we all have to pay attention to sustainability uh, because uh, we we do live uh, under constrained uh, resource uh, resources and uh, so Zomato is actively thinking about that aspect and we're thinking about it both on the environmental side which is how can we do more with less uh, and on the social side how can we be a platform for inclusive growth where everyone really benefits all the stakeholders in the ecosystem and I'll talk a little bit more about what we're doing as well as maybe how um, we could all be thinking about it 
uh, to build future communities as we go along. Hi, my name is Pavit Singh. I'm the owner and founder uh, of uh, Elysium Clubs. Uh, Elysium stands for, and bear with me here for a minute, uh, inclusive localism, take, picking up from what Anjali said, uh, for excellence in sports, education, and urban living management. I know it's a lot, everybody scoffs when I say it the first time. We work with all the largest township developers in the country right now. Uh, we've somehow evolved into a company that specializes in delivering experiences, building on the work uh, that Sila does and companies like Sila do. Uh, with eventual outcomes, delivering sales and alpha on the overall real estate price, but most importantly, happy and engaged consumers and residents. And uh, so I think I feel like I really belong in this conversation, uh, um, hopefully in this room amongst all these esteemed panelists. So yeah, happy to be here and uh, look forward to contributing to some, uh, some discussions here. As you can see, we have a bunch of people from varied backgrounds and varied industries. So when we were thinking about the panel itself, uh, we wanted to see, okay, who are the team members or who are the, who are the kind of industries we want? And I said team members quite consciously because we did not want any folks from Brigade on this panel, right? The idea of the panel really is to get feedback from multiple stakeholders doing very different things, but at the end of the day, still interacting with the building, right? So whether it's a MyGate on the tech side, the security side, the visitor management side, whether it is a Scylla from the services and the experiences side, you know, uh, Zomato comes into our properties regularly. How do we enhance experiences for the partners who come in over there? And whether it is the kind of experiential living and experience building that Elysium does. So I think we have a very power packed, uh, uh, you know, panel over here. We also have limited time. So I'm going to jump right into it. The way I'd like to structure it is I have a couple of questions that I feel I would love to hear from all of you on. And then with regard to your specific industries, I may have a few questions I'd like to start off. I'd be remiss if I did not start off by asking you about Brigade and what Brigade could actually do to enhance your involvement in our communities, whether it is with the way we design the buildings that we have, whether there are infrastructure needs, if there's anything you think that we need to think about as communities evolve. 10 years back, the needs of a community were very different. Yeah. 10 years back, there were very few players out there who had properties that were larger than 200 apartments at a time. Today, that seems to be a norm. The societies and the people that live in them are ever evolving, and therefore those communities are ever evolving. I'd love to hear from each of you in any order that you'd uh, you know, like to take up what we could be doing as developers to kind, kind of enhance your journey and enhance the customer experience in our projects from your point of view. So firstly, I mean, I think, look, uh, I'm not saying this because Brigade has called me here, but I think you all are the few that have been thinking about this for a while, right? Even if you look at your integrated townships, it's something that is trying to bring the community together. I think as creators of space, uh, a couple of things that across the board, pretty much all of the developers are doing today is changing the way spaces are made, right? It's no longer just an isolated gym on a terrace. Uh, it's, it's no longer just a small banquet hall uh, for the sake of putting it on a brochure. Uh, today, spaces are definitely becoming more multifunctional and more engaging. Y'all are, And it would be great to see more amphitheaters, et cetera, coming up because eventually when you all move out of the project and the RW is there, uh, they should have these spaces to bring the community together. From the actual bringing the community together, where I think um, everyone needs to focus a little bit more, is when you're bringing in partners into the project, right? And, uh, you know, Sitanshu is sitting over here. We've had detailed discussions about this where you start thinking about services being more than, is the property clean? Is there security? I think those are things that you take for granted now, right? Uh, but let's start thinking a little bit more about, okay, this is the partner that we're engaging with. What are you going to do to bring the community together? So at the time of selecting your partner as well, be it Scylla or any of the other sort of competitors out there, why don't you all start asking what are you all going to bring on the table for the community? So start planning a calendar. So the contract is actually awarded to someone that is saying, hey, look, I'm going to bring the community together every Diwali. I'm going to do this sort of an event. Christmas, we'll bring the community together through this and bring that thought process in. I think that'll really help 
because it'll be a lot more structured and uh, there'll be clear deliverables uh, to that. If you ask me, I think the one word is intent. Mm -hmm. All the developers are throwing in the infra. I mean, we are running projects which have some ridiculously un unviable infrastructure. We have golf courses, we have wave pools, um, we have, um, and these things are monstrosities. We have a two lakh square foot club, which is just unreasonable to, to it, any standards to be viable on the community. So infra is being driven by the developers. I think it's yeah. the intent of understanding uh, the infra outside of the architect's head and the promoter's head, and understanding that infra from the community's head, what is actually required for them. And when you look at it, you don't need the Taj Mahal infrastructure. You don't need a 200 crore club. You just need a really good energetic team of people that listens and understands the community. And most of our event budgets are like the really good ones, 15, 20, 30,000. And then we have a one crore, two crore event like we do for Lodar Palazzo. Honestly, the 15, 20,000 rupee events are a lot more impactful to your community. Yeah. So yeah. that intent with developers, which you're demonstrating right now with this, this yeah. very talk is, you know, we're looking at what our community wants. And I think that's the most important thing you can do as a developer right now. Just to add, I guess, to this point of how do you get to that point of um, designing experiences that cater to communities, I think uh, one of the starting points is in how you define customer. And actually, I mean, I'm going to draw on a little bit of what I learned at Unilever. And Unilever, it was very clear. We were an FMCG company. Our customers were actually distributors. But our consumers yeah. were actually housewives or it could be any segment that we were catering to. It could be young women for a cream. It could be young men for a male deodorant. But the important thing is that uh, in India today, there will be a difference between customer and consumer. Uh -huh. yeah. right? So you will have maybe the head of the household, typically a man walk in to check out your property, do the negotiation and all of that. Um, but if you don't talk to the women of the household, if you don't talk to the elderly, if you don't, if you don't understand the children's perspective, if you don't understand pet owners' perspectives, yeah. right? I think you would be missing out on, you will you'll not get to what the experience needs to be because these are the cohorts that are spending much more of their lives in the community than actually the customer who made that decision. So I think one is getting those voices in yeah. of the, of, and, and you know, in a structured way. Um, and then the other thing is to think about your product, which you think of as your township, not as a product, but as a platform. Yeah. It's a platform for many users. Yeah. As a matter of Blinkit, both are platforms. We are a platform for restaurant partners, delivery partners, and customers. Uh, and we know that while we focus on the customer in a, in a really uh, dedicated way, we have to continue to serve the needs of restaurants and delivery partners. And if we fail either of those groups, we will be out of business, right? So we are constantly innovating for that. I think just these two frameworks of who's your uh, customer versus consumer and a product versus platform may be helpful in thinking about designing these experiences. Adding to Anjali's point, first of all, to understand your TG, I think what we have seen, especially at Migate, is that most of the communities have completely homogeneous population. Like, for example, the community which I live in, mm -hmm. mostly as parents who have younger children. So it has almost 1,000 to 1,200 homes, I guess, and most of them are children below age of five. And why all of them have come together to stay there is mostly because of a extremely good kids' play area. So I think that's how like a lot of people are selecting homes today. And, and I can tell you people are being bombed for just staying that. So as a developer, one of the inputs I can give is that selection of TG and bringing something exclusively for them might be very important because what we are also saying is that people are continuously upgrading, especially in a decade or so. For example, the house which I might be staying today might not be the same house which I will be staying after 10 or 15 years. Yeah. That means at this stage of life, the needs which I have, and that is mostly will be around all the community people who are going to stay. So this is one of the important points and I am constantly hearing some of the smaller developers I think also trying to do this and that is giving them also edge. What I can see clearly in India, the communities which are coming mostly will be townships. People want to stay in large communities because of massive things like say traffic, younger children going to school. So, you know, if those things are in the community, it's a great plus for people. Yeah. And uh, one of the requests I think I can do for a large developer like Brigade will be to have slightly more commercial space because in the start, suppose that if there are only two to three places or four places, 
after some time they cap out mm. maybe they need more space and i see that rws are struggling like lot of our conversation with rws we bring lot of great stuff for them but due to space constraints sometimes it becomes difficult yeah. so maybe in the start if the space is more for them that is great and last one third minor point which is in my mind for developers is that security as such while there's not we want to do sometimes some smaller aspects we leave for example when a developer starts a project that time he will manage the property for say 2 3 years that time they are able to manage well but sometimes when it goes to the rw the handover Mm-hmm. and the things which they need to do they are not able to do and yeah. hence we are hearing some of the very very you know <coughs> uh, what to say bad news sometimes that some kid gets you know current in a swimming pool or yeah. something so how do we uh, navigate some situations and how can we secure the community for lifetime at least from the security point of view mm-hmm. maybe some things which i don't know from rera and how things can be done but maybe security angle can be lifelong managed by a, a builder mm-hmm. or how can they give such a great handover to them that it's almost automated because these rws generally are not free they they work day in day out their businesses or jobs <coughs> they give some time in the weekends and because yeah. very difficult for them to manage this complex issues 100 minds can never take a single decision yeah <laughs> yeah, I agree. yeah and and so not I, easy i yeah. think just to add on to what you're saying rohit even for <coughs> us uh typically the challenges or the points of friction typically are quite huge when it comes to the handover yeah. of a always. property yes. right it's always a push and a pull that yeah. uh, we are all managing with so i i think you're point is very valid in terms of how to manage that transition yeah. if at all because we know the transition needs to happen yeah. eventually this is not the business we are in not yet anyway <laughs> right so that that's definitely something to yeah. uh, kind of keep in mind i had a question uh, just taking off on what raghav was uh, also mentioning um today the service level expectation for the customer is sky high and i think that's great right uh, they have exposure to just so much uh, our customers are very well traveled there are facilities in the city and in the country today that they have exposure to so expecting a clean common area is the, it's the bare minimum right yeah, if yeah. you're not doing it then you're doing something wrong uh, and and this question maybe specifically to the two of you uh, rohit and raghav is uh, what what sort of a role do you feel technology plays and you know what's the kind of tech that you're deploying to kind of make sure that you're able to service these properties and what's the scalability aspect of uh, those technologies so see for technologies i think i think technology is a huge role to play especially in the prop tech today all the developers and buildings are you know today managed by some technologies and becomes very easy very cost effective so for example at my gate today we we are almost like a operating system in the gated community sap for a large company that's how we we have designed our product at my gate and it like it starts from almost you know managing everything in the community maybe taking maintenance payments from the people to managing your amenities so if 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 i can just speak for a minute we have gone to a each detail like if there is 1000 amenity and products in the community for example dg sets to mm-hmm. you know what not everything can be managed and their mcs can be recorded in mm-hmm. mygate backend mm-hmm. and at the front end the user can book your amenity for example there is a large community which has uh, two badminton courts if i and you stay in two communities we can book at the same time and go so these are small small things we have developed over the time and now there is time which i feel lot of communities feel that it's very difficult to stay without a technology product hmm. uh, to manage so but what i'm taking away most <coughs> is uh transparency yes really in whether it is the main convenience convenience, well. convenience, convenience well. yeah you know we built yeah. our masai uh, we built yes. uh, we spent considerable amount of resources yeah. at startup stage building the product that they have yeah and today we use 80% of our stuff is on my gate onboarding yeah because it's just easy and what we realize is uh, it's not a product it's a living breathing organism the, the software yeah and unless it's your core business and you're doing it day in and day out yeah um it's something that's unviable so we've been jumping ship and actually using thank you connect after this <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> a lot of my gate uh, products and it's been really a life saver from what we see bookings society bookings which are a big friction point yeah. democratic access to facilities without yeah. any one user group using it yes. these all things we've been able to do based on their platform so right what's awesome the job man thank you thank you thank you as far as the community part is concerned right i think my gate for sure like rohit said has been quite a game changer it's allowed people to collect cam easily post notifications about changes etc in the community i'll just use one example that we had which uh, when you you know mentioned this it came to mind So at one of the communities that we were actually managing uh we had set up a 
a WhatsApp based sort of help desk. So MyGate obviously has help desks where residents can raise tickets and through our property manager, what we said is typically when they go on their round, they might find that there's certain tasks that need to be done. So across the campus, we had pasted these little QR codes. Yep. As soon as you scan it, it opens up, it's a chat code on WhatsApp. So it opens nice. your WhatsApp and basically <clears throat> You can raise a ticket saying, you know, housekeeping over here is a problem and it'll go to the housekeeping supervisor. So you can set who it goes to. It's pretty easy to configure on the back end. There was a sudden month where we saw that the number of tickets have just gone through the roof, right? Surprisingly, and we were wondering what's going on and the tickets were not related to facilities. So what we actually realized, and this talks about how important tech is in communities, because what we realized is there was a bunch of these kids at the <laughs> property that were wanting to basically have a little thing saying I want to play football from this time to this time and there's 10 open slots so they created a mini football club where all of them had phones all of them had whatsapp so they went to our property manager and they said can you link a ticket for football specifically to these 20 friends of ours and one of those boys would go scan the QR code open whatsapp and post a, health, a, a yeah. notification saying that there's an open ticket right. and we need 10 people to come play football. <laughs> so oh. it became like a football club. <clears throat> nice. And then they started doing it with cricket and we, it was just so innovative. That's but really you think cool. about these 14, 15 year olds that actually came up with this and what it led to, if you think about it, is basically a community where <laughs> you could have cricket club, book yeah. club, all of this and the ticket would only get closed when, when they have enough participants. They would close cool. it saying we have a game. Yeah. So uh, that's that was just one really funny, that's interesting aspect. Very, right? very fun use case. Exactly. That, that is, just talks about technology, talks about the craziness of kids, which I'm realizing is mad. <laughs> and, 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 you know, j just just how, for the lack of a better word, jugadu, yeah. exactly, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. people can be, I think, it's, it's innovative. Of, uh, in the intercom days, the, my kids were doing this uh, to fix play dates. Yeah. So half the time that intercom would be ringing with some my daughter's friend calling is that she come to play? Yeah, I know exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, it's uh, I think uh, 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 we don't realize that the users of technology uh, may be very different, and and therefore, I mean, I guess my uh, two bit on technology is that don't forget who's also using technology. Maids are also using technology. Uh, you know, and and to be honest, one of the most uh, one, one thing that's happened ever since I moved and I live in a gated community in Belandur is that because we're so far from, um, you know, Kirana stores, my maid has become the queen of Blinkit. So I do think that uh, it ha technology has liberated some groups. I mean, it could also alienate certain groups unless you make that outreach to train and, you know. Make it more inclusive, really. Yeah, yeah, I think that, you know, and, and it's not, I don't think the day is very far when we would, we would start, like, say, coaching people on how to use. Yeah. And Google has done it in the past. <laughs> They've had... Uh, you know, sessions with um, rural women, training them on how to use. Yeah. Uh, but and, uh, so I do think that technology holds enormous potential to especially alleviate, uh, you know, at the end of the day, almost all of human innovation or invention was driven by this need for convenience. And, uh, and, and I think that recognizing that we should find ways to make access to technology uh, more, um, you can say, we increase the access to technology. But shifting gears just a bit, uh, you did mention inclusivity <clears throat> and then uh, you did talk about, uh, you know, uh, just ensuring access uh, to technology. Uh, when, when we were speaking earlier, you'd also mentioned an interesting social initiative that was also community engagement, right? Uh, I'd just like you to talk a little bit about that because I personally found that very interesting. And uh, while I'm not aware of any brigade property, whether it's, uh, you know, being managed by us or otherwise doing so, I think that, that that's a really cool uh, initiative. So People want to, in general, be engaged in good causes, mm -hmm. they, but it has to be convenient and it has to be, therefore, arranged for them in the community itself. They're not going to, even volunteering and stuff, if you ask people to travel for one hour to volunteer in yeah. school, uh, they're not really not going to do that as much as possible um, bringing a lot of social and environmental initiatives to their doorstep. So one of the things I'm thinking of is can we can we do co composting in our office uh, with the wet waste? Uh, and, uh, and these things are today we are seeing them as nice voluntary initiatives. Tomorrow they may very well be required by yeah, the law. municipality, yeah. you know, in the sense it's it's already <clears throat> municipalities are already overwhelmed 
yeah. with the burden of dealing with the waste that we all generate and uh, and we are conscious of that as a brand so zomato for instance recycles at this point 1.5x of all plastic that's used by restaurants for delivery so we've estimated it and we've got a contract for a recycler to recycle an equivalent amount uh -huh. but honestly that's probably not going to get us out of our sort of waste mess that is there right so um i think that uh, engaging communities in socially and environmentally relevant activities is going to become increasingly important yeah. this is yeah. also a generation especially gen z or alpha i'm not sure <laughs> is the one that's being taught about climate change yeah. in schools my daughter comes and tells me all these facts which uh, which scare the hell out I, of me actually yeah yeah points out probably where you're missing out every day <laughs> yeah but no. she spoke a bit about engagement yeah. and and really engagement on the social side of things yeah and uh, i know you're doing close to one event a, a day at least at various properties yeah. that you're deployed at uh do you have some sense of what percentage of these are towards social initiatives so um, most of our programs are clubs are actually sports and leisure clubs mm -hmm. and they're designed around this concept yeah but when we started uh, as a company my our company's primary objective is running sports and leisure clubs which is why we have all these sports brands and fitness brands uh, as we started getting more involved in larger townships we realized that's only 20% of what's actually the community's requirement we have education we have um, cultural events a huge focus on culture in the last 5 years that we've seen people want more cultural events more cultural events more indic events that's been something we've seen everybody wants national pride and all yeah. know about india's real history and not the whitewashed version of it literally um we've had spiritual events so in chennai for example which is a very orthodox market we have it's a 30% of all our events are around festivals sustainability unfortunately is only at the gen z level when it's a school initiative or mm. you know we do uh, clean up drives we do beach drives when we go trekking we don't just do trekking clubs or trekking clubs do trash collection along the way mm. and we don't come up with these ideas the kids yeah. come up with these ideas they make the parents do it so yeah but that being said the government is moving for example we work a lot with apollo tires manchester united uh, one of our partners epr is a thing uh, end product responsibility so for the last 10 years we've been taking apollo's shredded elts which is one of the largest pollutants in the world waste tires mm -hmm. converting them into uh, crumb rubble and using them to build sustainable football pitches in fact manchester united stratford and pitch is a uh, elysium product oh wow used from sustainable rubber we've got i think 600 facilities in the last 10 years that have been put up using this sustainable rubber yeah so yeah i think the whole world is moving towards that policies are moving towards that at a community level however i think more awareness mm. could be created yeah. i think as developers if you could kind of make it easy like she said make it really easy to segregate your waste make it really easy, easy to access a composting common composting yeah. area put up awareness instructions through my gate about community events around this i think that will make a huge really huge difference it's a great place to everyone wants to do something good and exactly it's about intent right <coughs> and and uh, talking of intent as real estate developers when we want to sell products to our customers we we market it quite yeah. well right we market uh, convenience we market lifestyle we market the ease of yeah. living in a property the product today is more standardized yeah right it is actually the experience that we have to deliver after yeah. the handover of the property that kind of defines yeah. the community and defines to some large extent the brand's uh you know equity yeah. in a customer's mind so if i i could ask hey what was that one point that was probably your biggest challenge right in working with communities in working with uh developers maybe rwas maybe if if there was one challenge that you had that you could tell us about so we could also think about how we negate or make it easier for you to transact we are known as the cushion pad of handover <laughs> okay. um handover time is always a war um and before the hra permission and handover of the hra when the, as long as the developer is running things because it's controlled because it's uh, also funded it's always beautiful the minute the handover happens it's a mess um india's riddled with handovers post handovers there's a efficiency rate of 88% failures on all common amenities in the country which is a huge number because hr is just can't handle it and the new designs are unviable commercially um so if you ask me the one thing that we think was the biggest issue is developers promise a lifestyle and they promise certain deliverables 
during handover, it's always going to be complicated. Communication suddenly stops when things get ugly because developers want to get out of that part of 50, 100 complaints from our experience. And that's where we get pushed in at Elysium, keep them busy, keep them distracted, do events. Don't let the complaints rise up while we sort out all our finishing and our handover compliance issues. So I think if that, there's so many amazing planning softwares. You all build these buildings in speeds that you can't imagine. Uh, you're so far ahead of the curve in construction. If that level of planning could be dedicated towards communication and handover process, um, involve, like you said, exactly the same points that we face. If you have a transition, so in, um, in Goel Ganga, we are doing this right now, we have a transition head, new position, never been thought of. His job right. is to liaise between FMS, CRM, and the potential HRA, which will be formed eventually, and us as a leader. And all he's doing is firefighting communications, and he's basically a communication head. And that's made a huge difference on their, their feedbacks, on their QR codes, on how the transition's being handled. So th I think that's, from our side, uh, yeah. new learning. No, we just, yeah. So I think that's a great point. I mean, we face similar things, right? We, I'm sure he'll say the same. In the middle of the transition, in the tug of war between the RWA and the builder, it's often us that become uh, part of the scapegoat because we're trying to balance this and try yeah. and minimize the complaints to distract them. Uh, I think... Actually, there is one, uh, without taking any names of, of who it is, I think they've done it right to a certain extent where at the time of sale itself, they start saying that we are going to manage the property for this much longer, right? Yeah. Because there will always be snags during that handover process, but they make a conscious effort at the time. It might be a little bit harder to sell, so sorry to all the sales guys in the room. <laughs> but um, they say that we'll, we'll stay for this much longer before we actually hand over the property. Uh, and in doing so, it actually gives you those budgets and maybe something to think about where they plan the events and the calendars where they are involved in distracting them during the snagging and the, yeah. the finishing of those snags, <clears throat> right? So, because I think at the end of it, like like he just said, with the developer, there's a clear focus, right? It's their logo, it's their brand on the, on the building, right? So it means a lot more to them um, to make sure that the handover is proper and you don't have a disgruntled customer at the end. Yeah. When the RWA takes over, and honestly, we deal with RWAs uh, while there's a lot of positives. There's also a whole bunch of politics between yeah. RWAs, yeah. when they change, yeah. elections. And all of them tend to have uh, you know, their own vested interests of what change they want to bring about. And it leads to everyone being in a state of limbo, right? So mm -hmm. a lot of approvals for you know, rectifications will not come through. Uh, simple repairs and maintenance will not come through. One RWA comes... Uh, they might want to focus solely on sports. Another one comes. So if you all are involved at that point, uh, at least in a certain way, post the RWA handover as well, uh, I think that will help solve uh, quite a lot. Like almost deal with 26, 27,000 RWAs. In fact, uh, if you ask me, I will be personally in 20,000 WhatsApp groups in India. <laughs> so oh in God, fact, to I add you, Pavit, you'll not believe, uh, you know, how we started in 2016 and I was telling this to somebody today that with one one community in Kormangla, we started this business. And somehow, uh, this has always been like a trust business. Yeah. If you have to be in the RW, you have to not win only one person's trust. You have yeah. to help the, this is after handover. So before handover, obviously the builder manages everything and mostly it goes smooth here. Yeah. From RW Pavit to your point, we have also created every year's handover uh, product in my gate. Oh, nice. So when uh -huh. one RW leaves and when the other RW goes, yes. my gate today conducts election in the community. Oh. They help to take the handover. And the handover is very difficult. So the treasurer, especially, who manages the finances, the ex-treasurer has to give all the uh, work to him. Yeah. And obviously, both will have diffi difficult schedule and the time will be very less. Yeah. And similarly to the new FM, and it's like almost, I'll say like, uh, sorry, the CMO maybe, you know, we'll see that whenever a new CMO joins a company, like he'll change the website, right? Or somebody yeah. who joins, yeah. like if I join somewhere as a sales side, I will, you know, change the CRM. Change for the sake of Similarly, as change. the RW, when they change, they will say, you know what? These all vendors I need to change. Yeah. Maybe it can be any reason, like they yeah. don't like the earlier work. Maybe sometimes they're right also, but that yeah. whole transition is very heavy on the residents. Yeah. Because suddenly they have to do so many change for yeah. just the change of so, so many people. Yeah. And mostly the intent is also right. People want to do great things. Yeah. So I'll not name, but yeah, a lot of people think that, you know, in the community I can do big things like I'll put big hardwares to manage the security. But you know, to buy one hardware, simple boom barrier, right? It's, it might not be very expensive. But to manage it yeah. over the time, it will break, who breaks and goes, repair. It's just completely to manage this with 1,000 residents, it becomes very difficult. Absolutely. So one thing I've seen is the solutions which will be in the community should be very simple to adopt. Mm. Whatever complexity is there, then it's 
trans, you know, transforming that complexity to 1,000 families to use it on a day-to-day -day basis has not worked. Mostly people who have been successful in this industry have been, who have come with simple solutions. And I think there is a day which will come like in future, like if we see markets like Dubai, or the US, mostly what happens is the RW does not manage all yeah. these things. I think these are companies like you guys, yeah. who are the RW basically does budgeting. They yeah. just, it's almost like outsourcing the entire work and in true sense. So true. I think there is yeah. the future, I think. Absolutely, EMR, this move to EMR communities. If you mm. see the take holding of EMR communities versus EMR properties, and you go to all the properties across UAE, they're all connected through EMR communities. Yeah. So while the sales and the products are different everywhere and they don't even know about each other, Everything is connected through EMR communities, which does the community management, the, uh, pretty much everything we do. But I'm sure we should approach them because they do it themselves. <laughs> Let's see your thoughts. Um, so one one point linked to handing over. I guess every time new families move into a into a building, I think the first services they will use today are Zomato because they've got to eat before yeah. the kitchen gets set up, yeah. or Zomato, whichever way you want to pronounce it. But having said that, so I think that, I mean, just speaking to that, it, I think the first thing that really happens in a new building is that other people have to come in. It's not just that family of five that you see in the ad. It's actually this probably the 30 people behind yeah, them. So uh, we have to remember those 30 people are going to have to come in and out. Um, I want to make it more convenient for women to be delivery partners, but they can't today because there are no toilets that are easily accessible for them. And, you know, I mean, really our cities are very unfriendly to women. Uh, they can't, you know, wait outside restaurants easily. But there is nothing manly about carrying one food packet yeah. from one restaurant to the house or one bag of tomatoes from a blanket store to a house that was your maid was doing it originally yeah. to begin with. So, and what is so manly about riding that Yulu bike? So my point is that we can build inclusive societies and ones where there don't need to be that many migrants coming into our cities to fill up these yep. roles. If we as uh, developers plan for uh, staff uh, who have to, you know, support this lifestyle and uh, their needs, you know, for instance, one of the things I've been feeling in my community is we have all these fantastic facilities for residents, but what about occasional movie for the maids? Right? What about occasional Mela? Right? They're, they're the ones who've traveled from Bihar, Chhattisgarh, and you know, so many places. And why can't we have uh, events for them? Yeah. Frankly, you know? So I think that uh, we have to think about all these layers. And uh, on the environment front, honestly, we don't have to actually organize environment oriented activities yeah. to protect the environment. But you do need to give a voice to everyone in the community. And technology can help, like he said, making democracy more possible um, and more visible, issues more visible. Water scarcity, tanker dependency, all of that will lead to impacts. Therefore, how are you going to resolve that crisis? It can only happen if everybody actually has a voice and everybody actually insists that this is how we need to solve this. So I would say focus on strengthening the democracy within communities and don't let, like he said, vested interests control everything because yeah. that can have like serious impacts. So environmental issues will get taken care of if you give people a voice. I think you're bang on as far as democracy within that space is concerned because uh, it's only when it's inclusive and everyone has a voice on yeah. the matter that I, I feel that real results can be uh, you know, achieved. To counter that comment, sorry. Mm -hmm. What I advise all developers is at the end of the day, as much as you have the HRAs, in play in your agreements in short from going forward for the first 10 years you're in control of all amenity assets yeah. it's hard for sales but do that because no one's going to take decisions otherwise yeah. voice give them a vote on how the decision happens but control the narrative is there anyone uh, who's doing that yes. specifically for amenities yeah. i'm yes. not not talking almost about almost yeah. every new launch we're doing mm -hmm. now when we enter projects we enter design stage so at design stage we're even talking about whether fsi should be consumed for the amenities so that they can now retain control over it versus handover. I'd say out of 14 new clubs that we're doing, which are more than 70,000 square feet, um, 13 of them are FSI consumed clubs, where the developer realized that its negative impact on its brand is so much more mm. than the cost of that one FSI of that square foot. Yeah. And the cost benefit is just unbelievable when you take uh, non-commercials into the narrative. So people are doing that. I mean, I can name almost every top developer now that we're working with. They consume their FSI, awesome. they control the narrative. Good to know. We'll also have that chat <laughs> soon. <laughs> awesome. Uh, okay, so thank you all so much. In the interest of time, I'm going to open up for questions.
questions. Maybe we'll have three, maximum four questions. If there are questions over here. So two questions actually. The first one to Rohit, Raghav and Pavit, uh, which is, uh, we spoke about this entire transition from a developer to an RWA, and that is truly an inflection point in the, in the entire project's uh, life cycle. What has been typically the conversion rate because, uh, and what ideally, because a lot of times the developers would be interested in getting all of these strategic partnerships in place, but then the, do the RWAs typically continue with the association or is there a dropout rate depending on the nature of product or a geography that you've been witnessing? Look, in terms of the percentage of them that go wrong, I think to answer that as a percentage would be a little wrong. Um, there's a few reasons why from a builder to the RWA, we've seen uh, you know that they don't continue with the associations of all of the vendor partners that the builder brought on. Um, one part which is no one's fault is that any large developer is going to be fully compliant and pay rates as per that. Uh, whereas an RWA that comes, the first thing that they want to do is that every there's this perception, right, mm -hmm. that builders are always out to make money off you, right? So they think, oh, they were overpaying and it shouldn't be this, and we can run it at a much lower cam rate straight away. So that's where one of them lose out. But like I said, there are numerous examples of a company, let me say Prestige, that runs it in-house, right? And they continue at most of their uh, projects in, in residential as well with the maintenance. And I think the reason for that is that they have dedicated teams that actually look into the handover takeover. Mm -hmm. Most other developers that we've seen try to shy away when things are going wrong and, and say that we don't want to get involved with the handover and they start putting the guys that are running the facility to go speak to the residents on project related issues. Right? So at that point, they definitely think of you as the bad guy and, yeah. and they remove them, right? Yeah. But I think if you're ready to stand there and, and continue and hear them out and try and solve those problems, most of your battle is kind of won over there. The uh, other reason which I'm sure he'll add to is you actually wanting to make sure that the amenities, if you look at Lodha, and that's one example where they continue and they maintain the amenities for life, right? And all of the clubhouses for life is because to them, their biggest sell point, even today in a lot of their projects, uh, yes, they might have a show flat for, you know, the flat and the marketing offices showing you what the flat would look like. But there's a large part where they, even in some cases, like right now in Bangalore, they've designed the clubhouse yeah. and they bring people into the clubhouse and say, this is what your clubhouse is going to look like for life. And we continue to manage it. So I think if you get that part right, and uh, in all fairness, most of the brigade projects that we've worked with brigade on, we've actually continued with the RWAs uh, for at least a couple of years. Then there's been one, two cases where they wanted to bring someone in cheaper, non-compliant, and then we've walked out. Yeah, no, but um, as long as we're not a burden on the camp, and in fact, we generate a lot of revenue, which is one of the big promises, financial sustainability. Uh, so residents tend to love us. That way we're able to, I mean, we're supposed to, the company's name is Joy of Club Life. Our currency is Joy. We call Joy Points for every resident. Uh, participation. So we've had like almost a 95% continuation on post handovers as well. But then again, our our lens is very different. Right? All the real issues are in infrastructure and that's sometimes not in anybody's control. Mm. For us, I think similar to Pavit, I think it's almost 100% because we are only in the software side. So mostly people start using the app from the start and then four or five years. They used to, they are used to yeah. the product. And uh, in fact, uh, what Pavit said, interestingly, we are doing it at a very high scale today. So Communities earn a lot of revenue from MyGate. So we do a lot of ads in the community. For example, the display of cars to events, to kiosks. Advertising. And to advertising in the community. <laughs> that makes like a large community of say 800 to 1000 flat will earn 10, 12 lakh years per year as an advertising revenue itself. In fact, whatever we do in the digital app itself, we earn some portion of that to RWS. So I think we have, that way we have a great relationship and there is not much drop rate. And, uh, so the second question also, I'll just put it out there, which was for Anjali. And uh, quick commerce has really kind of changed the consumer behavior. So much I, I could uh, relate with the example you spoke about, your maid ordering six, seven times. And my cook does that because she will start cooking something and then she'll say, okay, okay can you please place an order for this? And typically, uh, sustainability and convenience, intuitively, you wouldn't think of them going together. Yeah. Because yeah. Uh, gone are the days when, say, our parents would buy groceries for the entire month. We used to go out and get groceries for a whole week. Yeah. Now it's completely changed. Happy to notice about the 50% of deliveries happening through EVs. But uh, is there anything else also which the team is uh, thinking about?
So I do think this is a bit of a generational perception issue that happens with every generation, probably will happen with our kids too. I think we have a tendency to look at convenience as and anything that makes our lives easier as it must be bad for us in some way. <laughs> right? I think we felt this way about microwaves. We felt this way. My uh, in-laws still feel this way about tea bags. I mean, we have this thing about, oh, if it's saving us so much time, there must be something even What's embedded in it. <laughs> so I think that that's just natural human tendency. On, uh, But uh, having said that, the supply chain for quick commerce is actually super efficient thanks to technology. Yeah. It's your like you know your it's a um, it's like Kirana on steroids, mm. right? The convenience can have negative impacts on sustainability for sure. The good news is that on some waste streams, um, there's like quite evolved now eco ch uh, supply chains to recycle, for instance. But for others, there aren't so many. Uh, the supply chain is still evolving. Electric vehicles is a great example. We are not at 50% um, EVs, uh, EV-based deliveries, but we've committed to 100% oh. EV-based deliveries by 2030. We're currently, for Budzumato, we're a little under 10%. And this is primarily because, actually, our delivery partners are too uh, low income. They don't have enough of a credit history um, to be able to buy their own EV bikes. So they have an access to finance issue and they don't necessarily live in quarters which allow access charging. to charging. Mm -hmm. So what would be fantastic actually to promote sort of green living is if RWAs or uh, societies could have public charging points within the community for even two wheelers, not just think of your buyers as four wheeler owners and three parkings, etc. But also co to consider this entire service economy that is mm -hmm. coming back and forth, right? Um, so I do think uh, we can enable green living uh, by b uh, factoring in some of the new technologies to, uh, to make green living possible, including the technologies that RWAs may not be familiar with. So they're not going to be on top of developments in rooftop solar. Yeah. That is your job. Yeah. You know, yeah. they are not going to be on top of the latest sewage treatment plant technology, which only occupies this much space. That is your job. So I would think that, uh, sorry, Pavi, for telling you what your job is. <laughs> but having said that, being on top of that, that those clean tech developments is going to be the job of big corporate, yeah. including Zomato, Blinkit, Brigade, um, and the rest of us here. So we'll have to sort of plan ahead for communities. Thank you. Great, thank you. I'm going to take question. one more question in the interest of time and the schedule of our panelists. Yeah, this question is for, uh, in fact, Raghav and Rohit both. I would love to hear uh, from you. So we spoke about uh, selecting TG and then designing the amenities. Yeah. So this, we face always a challenge. So we don't know what, uh, it's, it's so dynamic. In fact, when we start designing, yeah. we, uh, we, we discuss and when we see, uh, I mean, the theme of the project, and we say, okay, these are the amenities we should design. I mean, finally, when we start discussing about it, so we, uh, is, there a, is there a mechanism where you can uh, measure or is there a way where there is a survey where you do to understand what are the amenities uh, today people would love to use? I think uh, I have just the answer for that. What you guys should do, I feel, is that go to communities like Brigade and talk to people who stay in tenants who are like on rent. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in my gate, we have seen most of the people in Bangalore especially, 55% of the owners stay and then 45% of the tenant guys stay. They generally stay in an area for three to four years and then they want to buy a house in the same area mostly because then they have selected that area that they want to be for now. So those guys are very aspirational. They are your next buyer. I think they, they will tell you what, what it is. So this I think can give a lot of info and uh, also to communities who are like say four or five years old now. That is second cohort where I think uh, people four or five years after like they have shifted. So maybe like a family which has been staying in the same community say for 10 to 15 years, mostly they are going to upgrade and change. Those are the second set of people who can give you a great thing, uh, you know, the info. For example, some of the, the latest trends I see in Bangalore and some of the cities that there's a huge demand for four BHK houses and a servant room. I had not heard about this like six, seven years back. Mm. Suddenly everybody wants a servant room and a four BHK. Talking to people who are your next buyers, uh, because basically I understand you guys have a TG in mind, yeah. which is going to take your house. Yeah. And with that TG, it can be very, very accurate because most of the people who stay in one community have homogeneous needs for sure. 
yeah, I think that answers a large part of it, right? <clears throat> the only other point, maybe that I'll say we can add is, so we have a separate division called Silla Engage. It was actually born because we used to manage most of the co-working players in the country at one point. And we saw that all of them have these community teams, they're organizing yoga, Zumba, all of this in offices. And we said, today, large clients of ours, like a Google, probably won't be in a co-working space, but have those Gen Z needs. So because of that, we started a division which was for engagement within commercial, we thought, called Silla Engage. And actually where that pivoted to is residential for communities and getting the community together. So they, that team is the one that typically works with all of the RWAs and builds out these calendars on what they want to do through the year, right? Uh, and most of those are actually done through a lot of polls that happen on my gate um, of what the community over there expects, what kind of events, what kind of amenities. So we've seen that a lot of communities wanted uh, sports fest, for example, and we brought that to them saying that, hey, we've identified a ground nearby and brigade, you know, Utopia will make a team, Prestige Lakeside Habitats, yeah. all of our clients make different teams and compete with each other. So these polls, I think, would be interesting insight in the, yeah, for y'all yeah. on what it is that that target group in that micro market expects. Because if the expectation was that they wanted us to organize, say, a paddle tournament, means there's no paddle court in and around over there, and that's where this need is arising from, right? Yeah. So I think that that team would be able to add a lot of insight. So we also would like to jump in. Sure, yeah. Uh, because we have a large division in Elysium, which primarily does this. We have 14 in-house architects. And out of those 14, 10 are traveling through the year to different parts of the world to see what the rest of the world is doing in terms of where this is going next. Um, paddle courts, like you said, um, large tournaments, like you said. Um, these are things that are available with your community today. But I think also you need to go out and see what the rest of the world is also doing. Um, you see so many new initiatives that are coming up that are going to come in like a wave to us and catch up like that. And then suddenly pickleball is a thing and there are 500 courses and True. you're yeah. the one development that missed out on it. Um, so yeah, I think definitely architects need to go out and see, engage with communities. And we do that a lot from our side. That's why we come back with the ideas. Um, thanks. I, I think uh, I have, as usual, uh, overrun the time prescribed. Uh, <laughs> my apologies to everyone for that. But it's been engaging. Uh, there has been a lot of learning for stakeholders from Brigade, from myself. A couple of uh, key takeaways for me, really, and I'm just these are I'm just picking out the ones that really jumped out at me, uh, which intuitively I had not thought of, but now suddenly makes a lot of sense, right? One is the engagement of the staff that is serving you. I, I think that is I think there's a social message over there to some extent because inclusivity in that segment is missing. But also, it is so much better for everyone in the community if that section is uh, happy. Happy. Happy, yeah. Yeah. happy, for the lack of a better word. Also, we do, when we talk about communities, we don't typically think of them. Yeah. You know, when we're talking about communities, even yeah. I did not, in all fairness, when we started off with the panel, I did not think of them as members of the community, but they are. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So I, I think that's been quite interesting. The transition head idea, I think uh, it's it's one problem that we typically grapple with quite quite a lot, and I think that that just makes sense. Somebody yeah. dedicated to do this, like an, uh, a subject matter expert in this, yeah. who goes from you know one property to other, just ensuring that the transition yeah. is uh, smooth enough. The definition of consumer and customer, yeah. again today, to understand how to build, maintain, and evolve a community, I think that that's fairly interesting. And uh, lastly, that uh, there's nothing manly about uh, delivery, right? <laughs> right? Literally, anyone can do it. And what we should be doing on the infra side to make sure we can uh, facilitate that. Yeah. On that note, you know, we have more than 500 disabled delivery partners. Yeah. Wow. Actually, I think that deserves a round of applause. I think that's a very good social yeah. cause. Absolutely. Thanks, everyone, so much. Thank you for joining me today. It's been really insightful. I thank you for your time and your participation. And thanks for members of the audience for being here and joining us uh, in this panel. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.